Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to the first session of BTVI's Alumni Speaker Series for the year 2023. We are so happy to see you back. It is so wonderful for you to join us on this first Monday of the month. My name is Alicia Thompson, and I serve as Associate Vice President of Fund Development here at BTVI. These sessions are designed to highlight the brightest and best of our alumni and to inspire excellence, not only among our other alumni, but also among our students, our family members, our friends, and anyone who is considering a career path in the trade areas. Again, we're so happy to have you. We also have with us this evening on the call, our interim president, Dr. Linda Davis, Dr. Davis, we are so happy that you have joined. And as you have, of course, over all of the past months, we are happy to have you with us. I just want to remind all of you who are attending that the chat function has been enabled. And we therefore encourage you to interact, place your questions in the chat so that we can have an exciting session as we hear from our speaker for this evening. We ask you also to invite a friend because it's going down right now. So thank you once again for attending. I will now invite Ms. Jeddah Says, an alum, with the official welcome. Good evening, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to this first session for this year, 2023 alumni series. Your attendance confirms that you have an ongoing interest in the success of our people and programs here at BTBI. And we are indeed glad to see you once again. This speaker series provides a platform, as our advisor mentioned earlier, for us to showcase our brightest and best alumni and we get to learn about their exciting journeys. We recognize the board members, executives, faculty and staff, students, alums, and friends of BGBI. We are here and we invite you to join in the conversation during the Q&A session. The beauty of this virtual session is that you may attend no matter where you are physically. I therefore extend my hand and encourage you to join hands virtually as we prepare for this year, 2023, for another exciting and informative session. You're all welcome. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. And listen, I'd like to say to you, if you don't feel welcome, then oh man, I don't know what to say. That was a warm welcome. I would also encourage you to invite others to join. So drop a note in that WhatsApp chat and tell them we have already begun. Now this evening, we are so happy because we're going to hear from someone who is very near and dear to us. So if you have attended over the past months, you will know that our speakers hailed not only from New Providence, but we have alums over all of the family islands and throughout the world. And so we are very happy that we have a special alum who will be speaking to us and he hails all the way from Grand Bahama. But before we get the introduction for this evening's speaker, I'll give you an opportunity to win some prizes. You know, I like to give away prizes. So I have a prize for the first person who will be able to give me the names of three of the speakers over the previous months. So three speakers during the year 2022. I will drop the email address in the chat and you'll have an opportunity to either email or you can enter your answer into the chat. So three of the previous speakers. Now, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to call on another one of our alums, Kimberly Boleg, who will now introduce our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson. Protocol having already been established, good evening to all. It is an honor and a privilege to introduce this evening's illustrious speaker. 
Mr. Keith Gibson was born in 1967 on the island of New Providence. The father of six now resides in Freeport, Bahamas. Mr. Gibson is the youngest of five children, the baby. But his sister calls him Uncle Keith. He has over 25 years experience in HVAC and over 30 years in electrical. As an alumni of Bahamas Technical Institute, he graduated with a certificate in electrical. Mr. Gibson furthered his education at the American He has obtained his specialized associate's degree in air conditioning and refrigeration technology, major appliance, a major appliance repair. He is certified in OSHA, scaffolding, and fire alarm system. Mr. Gibson received the AMP Award for Innovation in 2011 from Grand Bahama Power. He possesses keen leadership skills and a passion for teaching. His daily mantra is, each one reach one, each one teach one, until all are taught, by Mark Victor Hansen. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you our distinguished speaker, Mr. Keith Gibson. Hi, good evening, everyone. How y'all doing? Um, wow, in here gets a little hot, but anyway, I guess that's me. I'm on the hot seat. Okay, my name is Keith Gibson. I am the last of five kids. I'm the baby of everybody, but like she said, everyone still calls me uncle because I'm Uncle Keith. You know, I'm here for all my sibling kids. Yep. Even the grandkids, yes, I do have grandkids. I'm married with six kids, a little nervous. But anyway, um, I was born in Nassau in 67. This is where the long journey started. My father died. died when I was two weeks, the little boy had to grow up with their man real fast. Um, I school at in Nassau at Kamaiko Primary School, the original Kamaiko Primary School, which is now the detention center. I guess a lot of people from Nassau, I don't know if you know, but that's the original Kamaiko Primary School. I hear from a long background of educators. Some of the educators have own school named after them, such as C.I. Gibson, which is Charles Irvin Gibson, Thelma Louise Gibson. Um, P.A. Gibson, um, C.W. Sawyer, mother was a Gibson, married a Sawyer. And the list goes on for the ones who don't have an institution or school name after them. Um, we have a long list of generational Gibsons that are in the system right now. And I'm blessed to be one of them. And I guess this is where the gift comes from. Okay, um, I was actually born in Beantown, the original Beantown, the Beantown where a lot of influential people that spread across the Bahamas where they actually came from. Beantown back then was nice, peaceful, clean, and quiet. I can remember a lot of the neighbors um, I actually born in my great grandmother's bed, which is on Scott Street, right off of West Street. I have tons of family still that still resides in being town, both on my mother's side and my um, her, her father's side. Also, she does have an educator on her side, which is a slew of them, but one of them also have a school name after them, which is named Blatch. So. This is where I get that gift of teaching. Um, it's been a long road for me, okay? Now, my educational, my young educational start actually, when I left Nassau, we moved to Grand Bahama in 75. I started hospital, hospital primary high school 
from there, that's where I would say the boy turned into a man. Watching my mom struggle. And they're thinking about it, it, it really hurts. I had to find way, ways to grow up. I remember there was a lunchtime, this young, this, this next student, he had a pocket full of change, just like, wait, where do you get this money from? He said, I sell newspaper. I say, newspaper, what's that? He said, man, save your money and come with me. So I did that. Bought the news, I bought my little newspaper, start selling them, run back to Freeport News, buy more newspaper because you know I have to recycle the money to make more money to buy more newspaper. And I remember I ended up at the Pancake House by Boulevard gas station. Had my last six newspaper. It was already getting dark. Mommy didn't home. Lord. Um, I ran all the way from Boulevard to Explorers Way, which is about roughly three miles. Mommy was on the porch. Mommy didn't call police, FBI, CIA. She didn't call everybody looking for me. She then home, she got work for the government. 5.30, she should be. Everyone's supposed to be in the house. I didn't tell nobody where I was. Um, I was so nervous. Mommy on the porch and she, would, she didn't start rowing. I was so nervous, I started grabbing my little change out of my pocket and show her, we got from, I said, I was selling newspaper. Why you didn't tell me? So from then, I started making my own little funds to find ways to take care of myself and help my siblings. Then when I left my brother, he came, my sister's those, they came to make sure, look over me, because I was pretty tiny. I was a tiny little kid. A little bigger than a toothpick. But there's one particular day, Jesus Lord, on Friday, and I collect all my money from the people I credit during the course of the week. He ain't gonna accompany me. That's the day I get beat up and robbed. <laughs> yep, I got the money back, but the bottom line is it was a struggle, you know. Um, I saw newspaper from the time I reached uh, high school and I stopped. Still trying to find ways to make little change, make little money. I remember there was a gentleman who owned a restaurant called Island of South Sound Town Freeport. It was a gourmet restaurant. This man pulled up in this in our yard in this nice car because my mommy did him some favors because, you know, like I say, she worked for government. He says, um, Ms. Gibson, you, your son old enough to work? I run out to Rome. Only me one home, you know. Yes, sir. So he was like, um, you will come to the restaurant tomorrow, sit down, eat um, everything on the house, and let him walk to see how it. So I started working and making money from there. I actually learned how to cook seafood, which is my specialty from my Lenox. So I started as a solid bar boy, bus boy, bar boy. I ended up a cook. I actually was running a gourmet restaurant kitchen. Okay. But of course, the original chef overseeing me. Then I went on the bartender. I went back to bartender and I went back in the kitchen. Then I went as a waiter. So by the time as I hit the 12th, sorry, the 11th grade. I chose electrical as my trade. It wasn't easy for me because I was always working, always working. So what I learned in school, buddy pal, you have an exam, you better remember that course. By the time you get off from work, you got to, from school, sorry, as soon as you get off from school, you got to go to work. You come home 12, 1 o'clock. You got to sleep for school in the morning. So I still graduated with a good GPA, but I was always talking my class in electrical when it came down to the practical and the electrical portion. But I needed to boost up my grades out of, in, in other areas. So I gave up the restaurant and I started working at an airline. It wasn't for me. 
airline was not for me. I loved the traveling, but I gave it all up. So I said, boy, go back to school and do something for yourself. So here it is now. I signed up to NTC, which switched over from NTC to ITC, now BTBI. I graduated in 87. NTC started off in Grand Bahama, I think in 83 or 84, somewhere around there. They used the Hawks High School campus because Hawks High School, if any one of you know, that actually was the university of high school throughout the Bahamas. The courses were remarkable. The, the level of it was, it was humongous, it was great. But it still wasn't good enough for me because like I said, I had to, I had to work. So I enrolled, he used to pay you to come to school. So I signed up for, um, for the electrical and it wasn't easy. Another long road. I caught bus in the day and we used to have to hike ride with Mr. Paul Douglas or Philip Johnson and the car only so big, only so much trainees could get in, but I didn't make sure a couple of times I slipped in because I was tiny and everybody could get in quick and fast. But the first two rides with Mr. Douglas and Mr. Johnson was my last ride. Those guys used to drive like a bottle to hell. So I tell them, boy, everybody's like, boy, we ain't, we good. We ain't need no ride from y'all no more. We used to actually walk from Oxford to Freeport. That's another long ride, walk. And we used to walk that in the night. A couple of times, mommy attempted to pick me up. I know what mommy's side was back then, but I went side of the road trying to fly her down. And she's still passing me, you know. She must she do that a couple of times? I say, you know what? Let her go. Next day, I say, mommy, won't pick me up no more. I do it. So catch bus in the day when we walk home that long walk in the night. And if any one of you know how grandma was situated from Hawksville to the downtown area, that's a long walk. But it didn't stop me, you know. So I did whatever I had to do to learn and get a grip of this electrical trade that now that I'm at NTC, it's at a higher elevation than what it was in high school. So I did whatever I could do. I always wanted to be the first one to show my practical because I didn't want to be second or third. If I can't get it right the first time, it don't make sense it's me waiting to see who can get it wrong. I always want to be the first. You know, I was always competitive because school teaches you how to be competitive. Um, I remember one day I said, Mr. Douglas, we have to, I think we should carry all this toolbox. We should give each one of a toolbox so we could take it home and um, bring it back. He said, man, this is the school tools. I said, I think it's safe for us to do it because we could practice home. Next day we come to school, someone broke into the lab and took every last tool. Didn't even need dust in there. So now we have to go buy tools. So mommy, I, I still have money saved even though I was working. I saved my money, so I gave mommy money. She bought me a brand new toolkit with all the tools that I listed. She bought them back. So now here time for practical, because you know we're getting there we have to put put our hours together. I never worked so hard in my life. I remember I wired up three houses by myself. Me one, pulling wires, doing everything, reading plan, and I was doing this. Me one, I mean, these contractors back then, they were cold. They are cold-hearted, boy. I'll be honest with you. Thank God they changed now. These guys used to drop me behind God's back. I said, get the work done. So 
sometimes they just have to walk to where nobody is to get home. But that's fine. To get better in life, you have to sacrifice. And sometimes you have to take the blows. So I took my blows. Then here comes time for graduation. I didn't know, I mean, I, I didn't know I was that focused. I came top of my, my electrical class. I did something that I couldn't do in high school because I was working. I really needed NTC in my life. Sometimes you have to take a step back to move forward. And uh, that's what I did to try to elevate myself. So here it is now. I, I got a job at different electrical companies. Plus, I was still working in the night at the restaurant. Now, time to get paid. And then wire up two hoes. The fella gave me $89. I look at this little $89. I look at this $89. I see, but I can make this in a in the slowest night at the restaurant. So I kind of like dampened my spirit. So I just hung around. I know. Electrical repair work to keep me going. What I learned is we have to be careful when we allow young people to go on jobs, especially when they're good and they have a passion and they get hooked up with the wrong company. Then people take advantage of you. And I always believe in giving my best because life competitive. If you don't make the money, you have to have a skill. Continue in the restaurant. Then from there, I went to Lucayne Beach Casino. I excel in Lucayne Beach Casino. I was, within two years, I was a head cashier in the casino. Supervisors knew what I didn't know. It was a combination to the safe. That was it. Then here comes Mr. Hubert Alexander Ingram, the prime minister at the time. He had a big meeting. He said, as soon as he sit down, the casino is officially closed. Jesus Lord, I lose my job. So now I had to figure out, I had to calculate my money and see what's the next step. And I used to travel a lot on the casino junket. Because like I said, I, used to, I still continue doing electrical even though I was inside the casino. I always had a, a flyer from ATI in my backpack. Always. So what I did was, as soon as he shut the casino down, I went home, I pawned the jump on the next flight, jump on the next flight. So what I did was, I said, mommy, I go and see my sister in the States. I come in right back. Okay. My first stop was the ATI. I actually signed up. I enrolled into the technical school there. I came back Freeport. I said, mommy, I get in school. She said, about time. I said, mommy, I get in the States to go to school. I said, what? I want you. Honestly, I didn't know nothing about air conditioning. I was always intrigued about this thing. The casino used to be there at heart. And I can remember a lot of people used to come in there to try to fix the systems and they never could get it right. So that is where my passion kind of tilted from one trade to the next. So mommy's like, but how can you can pay for it? I give them my bank account, my bank book. Where do you get all this money from? <laughs> See, mommy is saving my money. And I said, um, I'm going to collect my salary. I can need you to get my salary because the deal is we got, I think we got like a percentage of our severance package. And it was promised that we would get our salary every week, including holidays and birthday until the ending part of the year. Mommy said, what? I said, mommy. I use this money and the money I collect, you collect and you put on my bank account and you bring for me whenever I need it. You can bring that to the States to me. So 
was on the next flight smoking to the United States, the world in school. You know, sometimes when you look for help from family, when you move from one island to the next, it ain't, it ain't easy. I literally was on my own. Even though I had family over there, I was on my own. Everyone turned their back on me. I didn't do nobody nothing. I was always a good child. But when you run and cross strangers that see something in you and they take the time to invest in you. And this lady, she didn't know me from that. She just, I was dropping deposit from one um, apartment complex to the next, to the next, to the next. I got so tired, I called this place, Somerset Apartment. I told the lady, yeah, I honestly need a place to stay. Um, she says, come in, come into the office. Let me meet you. So I went into the office. She met me. She showed me some apartments. I, I just wanted one. I, they were all nice. I just wanted one. I picked one. She's like, Mr. Gibson, to be real, I can't do a security background check from you because you're not from here. Say, from what I see in you, I know I could trust you. I say, wow. She says, what you do is you go collect all your security deposit that you put down in all these different places and you bring that to me. So by the time I did all that, went back, this lady then had Florida power and light turn on my power. She didn't have my cable turned on. She said, I'll deal with the first couple of months for you. I had no furniture, no nothing. I quick and I go on to, I caught the bus, went and get an air mattress, and that was me in one big, one bedroom apartment, but just an air mattress, no TV. I caught the bus to and from school. And remember, I always wanted to be the first one out. I had a great teacher, Mr. Detello. Um, I was learning this thing called air conditioning air conditioning. I can believe I actually was paying attention. Exam time, I would mash it up, mash it up, mash it up. Practical time, I would mash it up, mash it up, mash it up. Um, I did successfully well. And now here comes all the family. Everyone start coming back around because I don't need them anymore. I got my car. I had a little job working the Shell gas station in the night. I was working 11 in the night, getting off 7 in the morning, got to be to school, 9.30 to 3.00, getting paid good, family members start coming around. Animosity, I do what I always do, smile and brush it off, you know, smile and brush it off. So. I got a job offer with this indoor quality company while I was in school. So I spoke to my instructor and tell him um, I got a job offer and I need to try it out. He said, no, not yet. Not yet. There's a trade show coming up, an HVAC trade show. And they had it at the harbor at um, Fort Lauderdale Harbor Convention Center. Okay, fine. I went to the trade show. I went to every last air conditioning booth at that trade show. And I introduced myself, because you know, I have on the ATI uniform, my name is there. And I was asking the sales rep, everything about their product and, you know, just asking questions because still learning, still intrigued. So the trade show was on that Thursday, Monday morning, no word of lie. The school got, had a stack of messages for me. I say, I asked my instructor, what this all about? He said, well, you at the trade show? I say, yes, sir. He said, um, take out the 305 
and the 561 and just leave the 954. I say, what? He said, the area codes, the 305 is Miami, Palm Beaches is 561. Just deal with the um, 954. And here comes when Volvo pull up in, in the school parking lot. I remember when gentleman said, you're going to work for me. This guy come to, he come to the schools for me. So, okay. I, my, my, my instructor said, take this job, this man, serious. I took the job. It's a different indoor quality company. They were pretty big. So I say, you know, let me combine indoor air quality, seeing that HVAC, the air conditioning portion, that's also tied into indoor air quality. So I started working with this air indoor air quality company. We were cleaning ducts, doing air samples, doing a lot of building inspections and stuff. Now here, here comes my the next boss of the company is like, I just enroll you into a HVAC certification course. He said, it's gonna be for a week. You just take it and, um, and I know you're gonna pass. I said, pass. He said, yeah, man, you're gonna do good. So I went to the, I went to the, to the course that he sent me to. And I ain't gonna lie, I felt small. Everybody inside the um, the room was like doctors, engineers, risk managers, and they had a couple of lawyers in there. And my boss, he was there too, because he was also a guest speaker. So when we so when it's time for me to introduce myself, I say, well, I don't have no title behind my name, but I'm a student at ATI and uh, I'm here to learn. That's all I had to say, honestly. So I went to my boss at the time, Patrick O'Donnell. I say, sir, you just put this little sheet in the pack of wolves. I say, you see those people? He tapped me on my shoulder. You're going to do better than all of them. I look at him like he's crazy. He said, you actually doing the work. You don't know the practical side of it. Now you're going to get the theory side down pack. I was, I had a folder about this thick. No, I still have that folder. I could bring that folder right now and show you. I had a folder this thick. I had to learn that in a week. Okay, here comes exam time. I... Jess was writing, flicking page, flicking page, flicking page, boom, I'm finished. I think I was one of the first one finished. The exam was on Friday, so I went to work Monday. All I see was everybody come around me, one big cake, congratulating me, say, I pass. I said, what? So Patrick O'Donnell, he leaned over to this guy named Sean, and he slapped him back and said, he got a higher score than you. Say what? He did all the psychometrics. No one got them right. And he answered everything. He got the second high score. Wow. Wow. I couldn't believe it. So anyway, I started. After a while, I started to lose the interest because I was like, I come over here to learn air conditioning and refrigeration. I need to get back into the game. So they actually hooked me up with a company called All Star Air Conditioning. Um, it was located in Damien, Florida. That was the rule in my know. When I say he was God sent, he was God sent. My first day on the job, no word to lie. He asked me to check air conditioning unit. He stayed in the truck. So I took the panel down do my check, boom, 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 boom. I came back and I told them what was wrong with the unit. Why did you go directly to that part? I said, because I already troubleshoot the whole unit and um, the transformer on the low side, on the secondary side is bad. I say, I have, a, I have an open circuit. 
So he came over, he checked it. He said, okay, take it out, put it in the one. I ain't gonna lie. Because he was standing on the side of me, I was so nervous. If you'd put two cowbell in my hand, well, I was so nervous, I'd shake them like, like that. So he say, um, you got a problem I, I need to know about? I say, no, sir, all right. He say, well, take the part of going back, because he on side of me, dead nervous, start shaking, start shaking again. He said, you got epilepsy or something? I said, no, no, sir. So he said, look, take your time and breathe. He said, I know what's going on. He said, what? And he poked me up here. He said, what you have up here, let it flow gradually into your hand and breathe. He said, I didn't see you smart. Most people on the first day would pick this up. This is your first job. So I breathe, I breathe, I breathe. I took my time. I changed all the part, nice and neat. And we went to the next job. I got that unit running. I went to the next job. So now, went to the next job. I figured that out. Figured the next job out. And he was impressed. Even though I was a little nervous. So he says, you know what? I'm going to let you go on your own the next day. So the next day, I was by myself, going from job to job by myself. The first job I going on, I don't know. I got cold feet. I grabbed my next on the radio. Help, help, Basra, FBI, I need help. I, he's like, what? Calm down, calm down. So he said, what's the, what's the problem? I told him. He said, well, how are you going to fix it? I told him. He said, so what's the problem? I said, you know what? Myself. The next day, he called me about 11 o'clock. Hey, little buddy, what's up? I say, everything's cool, sir. Where you at? I say, well, I'm on the third job, packing up to go to the fourth job. He says, well, what happened to the other two jobs? I said, I already complete them, sir. I already collect the funds. I'm about to collect the funds from this job and then go to the next job. Um, leave the next job. Um, meet me at, um, it was a place of a, Near the harbor, it was a little restaurant he used to like to go. He told me meet him there. And then and they say, order Stacy. I say, but the other job, he say, leave that work. I need you to relax. Every time I did something well, he rewarded me. He every week I got an extra check based on my work, which was I got extra money every week. And he would get calls based on that technician you sent to me yesterday, I need him to go to my family house to do a job. He would get calls every day just for me to go do work. Sometimes the neighbors watch me do work. Can you come to my house? I call my boss, say, yes, they do the next neighbor house. Just servicing, you know. I learned that and I ain't trying to knock nobody if he's American. I learned that American people rule. Where I grew up in hospitality industry from a child to a young adult, I learned that the people wasn't used to my type of service, my type of personality, that warm greeting. And I'm explaining to them why this went wrong, how that went wrong. That's actually doing a full, full assessment and letting the customer know exactly what the problem is, what to do to not have me come back. I remember there's a, a job that he sent me to. I explained to the gentleman that his coils needed cleaning. If his coils don't clean, you're gonna lose your compressor. Two weeks later, compressor gone. Anyway, call, call my boss to have me come back. I did the change out and everything. My boss came with me along with my next co-worker, Vitaly Dorbino. 
because he's actually from Ukraine. And they watch me do the work because, you know, I want to do everything by myself. I'm still learning. Even though I'm doing certain things, I'm still learning. And the customer reached over. He put some money in my pocket. And no one saw it. I thought no one saw. So my boy leaned over, lunch on you today. <laughs> so he laughed. I said, okay, then. We go on to lunch. The bill come. My boss snatch it. My boss push your money underneath the table and give to me. So, hold on. I ain't found the money in my pocket yet, you know. So when I pull the money out of my pocket, the customer was so impressed with the work, I got $500 tip. I tap my boss, and he give me 100 I show him all the money, because I'm open and I'm honest. I don't like to hide stuff. I don't want more, no one that never second gets me. And my boss said, you know what? He gave me an X hundred. That ain't even my paycheck. You know, I actually was, I was getting paid well. The good flip side about it is because of my personality, I was getting tips every day, every job. And I love this. So here comes homesickness. A lot of my money is actually spent on um, Bell stuff. Calling home, calling home, calling home. I miss home. The only time I was separated from my mother was when I went off to school, even though she would come over and spend time with me. That's the only time I separated from her. I miss home. Call me a mama's boy, but I miss home. That was one of the saddest days of rolling in life when I left. He cried, literally cried. He came over to Freeport three times, stayed right in the house with me, begged me to come back. I say, sir, I'm home. Home. This is where I honestly want to be. Anyway, we still kept communicating. Every time I go over, I hang with him and his family. Sometimes he used to get angry. I rent car and I rent hotel. All these vehicles I have here. <laughs> like I said, he was God sent. And um, I'm happy that God put him in my path. Um, God one knows where I would have been, um, I might have gone to a, a, a terrible company where they might have treated me like dirt, but he honestly respected me as a person. He really looked out at me. I never had no one really, well, I had a lot of people look out for me, but I'm in a different country now um, on my own. So he frequent Grand Mahama several times. Um, like I say, every time I, he, he's gone now, he, I always think about him. I always talk about him. He passed six years ago. And that hurt, you know. But the bottom line is he was, he always said, I want you to be a technician. You're going to be great. So now here it is. I'm in Freeport doing a little stuff for myself. I say, no, let me get a job. Went to time coming up. So I got a job at an air conditioning company. The man, the gentleman who owned this particular company, he says, um, Keith, I need you to check this job, that job. I said, okay. I said, um, how I can get there? He said, your car. I got him, my what? I said, no, sir. My car ain't part of your company deal. Anyway, he took me. I did the jobs, came back. The next day I went and I say, sir, I honestly can't work for you because I, I'm not used to this setup. You know, um, he said, well, I don't have no money to pay you. I didn't collect from the jobs. I say, sir, you keep your money. I don't need it. I good. So I left that particular company. Went back on my own, got doing pretty well. Then this gentleman, Junior Camp from CNG Air Conditioning, he was watching me. He said, 
I'd like for you to work for me. Name your price. I gave him my price. He says, okay. I look at this man, what? <laughs> he questioned me, he said, okay. Okay. So I, I gave him all what I had. Um, I had people who would actually walk in his establishment. And I guess the price was too high. They'll come, um, hey, you want to do this job for me? I, I say, no, sir. I work for him. He just walk out that door. I have respect for that gentleman. I said, you have to leave. Don't ever disrespect me because you disrespecting me. You want me to go against my boss who treat me good. So you finally hear me cussing someone on the parking lot. Because he, he, he knew. I didn't tell him. He knew what was going on. If he had asked, I would have told him because I'm straight up. So I had to do a job at BTVI, Freeport Campus. Mr. Samuel L. Rigby. It was a job in the um, mechanic, I think it's a mechanic um, lab. I went there, I did the repair. It took me like 20 minutes to do the repair, had the system running and everything. So I told Mr. Rigby that he's good to go. Mr. Rigby, he had this question mark and he had this look on his face. He said, I finished. So he said, come, let's go. So I go on in the bar there with him. And he says, you know, people been here to fix this one unit. I never get it run. I say, well, sir, we don't use dye. I say, one, your unit was overcharged. Two, someone for dyeing it. Three, your main issue was your controls. Okay, I say, now this is where the electrical side come back. Air conditioning and refrigeration entails all the trades in the world. Believe it or not. Believe it when I tell you. Um, air conditioning consists of electrical, mechanical. When I say mechanical, we have compressors that you have to take apart like a car engine, put it back together. We have pipe fitting, which is plumbing. We have software which is part of electronics. We have to size equipment and fabricate stuff. You know, when you fabricate, you're more or less on the carpentry side, but even though you're dealing with sheet metal and fiber duct, you have to do these things precise. Similar like how a carpenter would cut his wood and things like that. Um, you have to braise using a torch, which of course is either you solder like plumbers or you weld like a welder, but air conditioning and refrigeration technicians, we braze. So those are all of the trade that actually exists. And then of course, for people who do air conditioning, you have to know a lot about inner air quality. So anyway, to cut a long story short, Mr. Rigby was like, he was impressed. So I say, Mr. Rigby, you remember me, hey? He say, you know, I say, when I was in third grade, you give me a cut up, I'll never forget. He said, I beat you. I say, for what? I say, well, Mr. Rigby, I was in assembly and some boys were trifling in the back and they started pushing each other and I moved forward. And then Mr. Goldsmith grabbed me and them and you ain't asked no question. You just give me what I can remember all them years now. <laughs> so he say, boy, it must be real good when I say, yes, sir, it was. And you just eat breakfast, so you know you had plenty of energy. So I said, man, do my job, man. So he said, tell me a little bit about air conditioning and refrigeration. And I guess I gave him a, a little summary. And as I was speaking and explaining to him about the history of air conditioning, where it started to where we are at that particular point, and I've broken down the major components in it, I honestly felt my instructor was actually in me, just disseminating this message. That's how much I've paid attention to my instructor. 
And he was impressed. He said, boy, I got one job, you know. I need an air conditioning instructor. I need, I have a class to already sign up on. I just don't have an instructor. So he said, man, I was only joking, man. I, I good, I good, I good. I only joking. He said, man, give me a number, give me a number. I say, sir, I good. He said, give me a minute. He run in the office, come back for my application. I say, sir, I, me teach? He said, if you only know what you broke down in front of me just now, you ain't got no book, no nothing. You just, you just broke it down. Now, Mr. Rigby, God rest his soul, he was a serious senior educator in the Bahamas. He no talent when he see talent. Ask Mr. Roker. He gave Roker's job too. He said Roker is our HOD. But anyway, fast forward. This man run me down for two weeks. I get tired of Rigby messing with me, man. So I say, you know what? Let me take the job. So I say, look, I just moved from the States. A lot of my stuff ain't reached here yet. So I'll do a, I'll do my course online, do this, do that, do this, do that. And honestly, I did my course online for the first time in my life. And when he looked at it and how I broke it down, he was really impressed. Man, I know nothing but teaching. <laughs> so anyway, he sat in my class for the first couple of days and he was, he said, Gibson, you know you have a gift in you. I said, gift? He said, Gibson, you have a gift in you. Give me a chance to finish, pull it out of you. You're young. Trust me, I can use you. And that was in October 2000, I was hired at BTVI. Wonderful. Now, now Wonderful. 2023. And you're still at BTVI. I'm still at BTVI. <laughs> so Jeez. let's stick, let's, let's stick a pin. <clears throat> let's stick a pin because you have had a, a quite an interesting journey, very interesting journey. But I have some questions that I have to ask. And so you get an opportunity now to tell us you are an adjunct at BTVI. In one sentence, what is the most rewarding thing for you being an ad, excuse me, being an adjunct here? What is the most rewarding thing? One of the most rewarding thing is me giving my all to my trainees. I love what I do. I always tell Ms. Corley and Roka. I have for the money, you know, I love what I do because I have generational gift and I have to give it back. I got three needs that pick me up. Hey, Gibson, where you is? Mom, let's go to lunch. Up to this day, I have three needs and that's what I never met. They pray God I come now, store. Next question. What's your advice on balancing school and work? You said that throughout your journey, you had to balance school and work. What's your advice? One sentence. Be patient. Breathe, take the licks as it come because it ain't easy. What do you say to the people who say a woman can't raise a son? Because you told me, you told all of us that your father died at an early age. So what do you say to a person who says a woman can't raise a son? Ali, my mama ain't raising a son. She raised a man. That's what she did. Um, she grew me up a little tough. She gave me chance and mommy speak. You have to be careful what you say to kids. Mommy talk, everything. She speak it on me. That's what she did. When you were speaking, you said that these contractors was cold, but they used to drop me in the back of nowhere and leave me. How did those cold contractors contribute to your success today? One sentence. It was a pros and con. The pros is I did successfully well. They passed inspection. The people got the power on. The con is for someone who's weak mentally, you could break somebody like that. Why didn't you allow at one point you wired several houses and you got $89. At another point, you went to work and the former prime minister told you, hey, um, you ain't got no job by the time I walk up. Why didn't you just give up at that time and throw the towel in and say, man, look, okay, I just gonna stand on the end of the corner and bomb a few dollars. And what's your advice? What's your advice to the, the people who have faced these challenges? And, and uh, what's your advice? One sentence. 
I want to make it in life. I want to make my mommy proud because it's all about her. It's, it's how she see me. And my mama lives with me right now. She said she ain't going back now. So, so she's with me. When you got your severance, you could have purchased a real smooth, soft ride, but you didn't. You went to school. Why is that important? What advice do you give to persons who are listening now? Why choose school? Competition is real. If you want to be, if you want to make it in life, school teaches you how to be competitive if you pay attention. I already had a nice ride too. Because mommy say never get, get let yourself walk, catch yourself walking. So I got I buy two cars, nice car. But I gave it all up to go to school to better myself because I tired of counting the man money. I will make my own money. When you went off to school, you said you had lots of challenges, lots of challenges. Why you didn't just jump back on the plane and come home? What advice do you give people who face challenges even as they pursue what they want in life? Don't quit. There's always light at the end of the tunnel. You just got to take it step by step. My former boss, Roland, you know, he's like, hey, Keith, you know how to eat an elephant? Look at him like, you crazy, I say. Eat an elephant? I say, no. He say, this is how I'm going to teach you. You eat an elephant one piece at a time. How important, how important was your start at BTVI? Because what I want you to do now is to wrap this up for us. How important is it for someone who is enrolled right now or someone who is contemplating enrolling? What is it that you got at BTVI that you feel laid the foundation for everything that happened throughout your life? BTVI gave me the opportunity, a second chance in life. Remember I was working all the time from high school. BTVI gave me the skill set. They better my skill set. Um, it gave me a chance to, you know, what, you know what it is for a young little boy to wire up houses and people pass expression on one shot? I wasn't even a rookie. And you start off small, it's going to be a lot of rain, but you have to weather the storm. I encourage all trainees, take a step back, better yourself. If you have a trade, get a next one. Life is full of competition, and you don't know when one trade is going to go down and the other one is going to go up. So it's best to grab whatever you could grab and excel. Do you currently have your own business? I still do side work, but I have like six or seven trainees that beg me, and I understand. They say, Gibson, you don't belong out here. We need you in the classroom to make more of us because all of those guys have their own company and they're doing exceptionally well. And I'm very proud of them right now. Last question, opportunity spotting. When you spoke, you said that you were originally, you were initially in electrical, studying electrical, but you noticed that it used to get very hot in the casino and people would come and can't get the AC fixed. How important is it for our alums, for our students, for anyone listening to you to be able to spot an opportunity and to know, okay, that's the direction that I'm going to go in? We go right back to, to what I was saying is, um, had I been treated better in the various electrical contracting companies, maybe I might've stuck it out. So I say, you know what, let me try this new trade and I could combine all two. So if one starts to fail, I could go into the back into the next one. So I'm very versatile at Grand Bahama Power where we keep the lights on. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, 
That brings us to the end of another session. We are just so happy that you joined us. We thank you, Mr. Gibson, for all that you have told us this evening. We know that it was a mouthful. It was a very long journey. We thank you for just tying it into what BTVI means to you. And we do trust that you were encouraged for having attended. We encourage you to continue to monitor our website because there are a number of exciting activities planned by the Alumni Association for this coming school year. And we encourage you to support BTVI. So once again, we thank you so much, Mr. Gibson, for such an enlightening presentation. We thank all of you who have provided your questions. We invite you to send us um, recommendations or suggestions on how we can make these sessions even better at alumni at btvi.edu.bs. And once again, we wish you a pleasant good night.